Hold on one second. Okay. Sorry. All right, not this. But Barkley. It's George Barkley. Sixteen eighty-five, seventeen fifty-three, um, and uh, the book that we're reading, which is usually called the Principles, was published in seventeen ten. So uh, that was twenty years after. Locke published the essay concerning human understanding and six years after Locke's death. So we've moved forward a little bit. Um, and let's see, what are the things that I want to say about Barclay? Um, so as I mentioned before, he was um, Anglo-Irish. He was born in a castle in Ireland. Um, and he published the principles. Actually, I used to think that he was in London when he published the principles, but apparently it was when he was still in Ireland, actually. So um, it was after he graduated from Trinity College in Ireland when uh, he published this book. Later on, he spent time in England, mostly in London, uh, in Europe, and back in Ireland. And then in Bermuda, where he tried to found, fund a college, he stayed there for several years until it became clear that the parliamentary funding he was expecting wasn't going to come through. And then he returned to England. And then after that, um, uh, he returned to Ireland, and he was made a bishop in the Church of Ireland in 17. 34. So that's actually a long time after he published this book. Uh, at the time he published this book, he wasn't even uh, a priest in the Church of Ireland yet. Uh, but nevertheless, you usually hear him called Bishop Barclay because that was his title when he died. Um, and uh, that's all I want to say about his life. Are there um, questions about that? Oh, so I just, so there's a question. Will there be a discussion due this week? There should be a discussion due this week. Is Sean here? I think it was his turn to post it. I didn't check. It was his turn. It was his turn. Is he here? 
Not sure. This, of course, is an order of first name. Seems like he's not here. I didn't get any email from him about this. If no text is posted, there will be no discussion due this week, I guess. Oh, he emailed about his Wi-Fi being down. Um, okay. Uh, he didn't email me, at least as of last time I checked my email. Okay, um, I don't know, but don't worry, you definitely will not be held responsible for a discussion that uh, was not started, so it's not your problem. But thanks for alerting me to that. Okay, um, any questions about Barclay? If there are, I probably don't know the answer. I don't know that much about his biography. Um, this book, it's, so the full title is A Treatise Concerning the Principles of Human Knowledge. It's usually called The Principles. Um, and it was supposed to have two parts. So the first part was going to be about ideas, and the second part was going to be about spirits. Um, and uh, according to Barclay, he actually wrote a large portion of part two. But then when he was traveling in Italy, he lost the manuscript and he couldn't bring himself to write it over again. So part two never appeared. So that's why this book has an introduction and part one and no other parts. <laughs> it's kind of weird. Um, okay, and the reading for today was the introduction. So, um, Okay, I'm just gonna, I could say other things about other books he wrote or something, but you know, you can look that up on Wikipedia. <laughs> I'm just gonna start talking about his argument in this book, which is most, which is his most famous and widely read work. Um, so, uh, just as a brief summary of Barclay's position, um, So before I even get to the contents of his metaphysical view um, or his view about ideas, um, this is his view about the progress of philosophy. It's the progress of bad philosophy, I guess. And it has four steps. So, I mean, that is, we start off with common sense. The first step is that we discover certain prejudices and errors of sense. Actually, I think it's prejudices, comma, and errors of sense. This is basically talking about the beginning of the first meditation, um, right? We discover that uh, many things that we believed since our youth turned out to be false. I think that's the prejudices. And we discover certain errors of sense right, the tower that, if, well, actually the tower comes up later in the meditations, but anyway, my senses have sometimes deceived me. Um, the example from later is a tower sometimes looks round from close up and square from far away or the other way around, I always forget. Um, so that's the first step. The second step is we attempt to correct them
by reason. Um, so here, I mean, it's not clear that he's still thinking about Descartes in particular. Um, or, well, maybe he is thinking about something Descartes did, but before he ever wrote the meditations, right? That is the first thing we do when we notice this is we start saying, okay, let me try to think clearly here and figure out what kind of prejudices and errors of sense I might be involved in. Um, and, but in doing that, Locke says, I mean, Glock, Barclay says, that we're insensibly drawn to certain uncouth paradoxes. So I think this refers to what happens in the first meditation and really the following meditations where uh, Descartes ends up proving that I can't be sure that the world exists and I can't be sure that my body exists and all stuff like that. Those are uncouth paradoxes. Paradox is not in the sense of self-contradictions, but in the um, root sense of the word paradox, namely that it's something that goes against our ordinary opinions. So something that we find it really difficult or even impossible to believe is a paradox. And the result is either we give up, and well, no, I shouldn't say that. Either we end up back where we started, or, okay, or Barclay says, we sit down in a forlorn skepticism. Um, and here, I think, uh, well, um, mostly when Barclay talks about skepticism in this book, he means skepticism about the existence of the external world, the existence of bodies. I think maybe here he's using it in its stricter sense, meaning that we just give up on trying to learn anything at all. We say we should just suspend judgments. So, I mean, I think the first one that we end up back where we started is probably, although I'm not sure, supposed to be his understanding of what happens at the end of the meditations. If it is, it's like not really a correct understanding of the meditations, as I point out when I teach them, although Descartes in the end does prove that the world exists after all. It's not really exactly the world we, that we thought existed before the argument started. It's quite different. Um, it really doesn't end up where it started. But in any case, uh, Barclay is saying that at the end of this process, we don't get anywhere. We either just um, somehow convince ourselves to return to common sense, or we just give up on trying to find out anything at all. This is all in section one. Um, oh, I forgot to do my little thing. Wait, hold on. Oh, no. That's right. All right. But now what I actually wanted to do was section one of the introduction. All right.
But no sooner do we repart, depart from sense and instinct to follow the light of a superior principle, to reason, meditate, and reflect on the nature of things, that a thousand scruples spring up in our minds, blah, blah, blah. Um, and we are insensibly drawn into untrue paradoxes, difficulties, and inconsistencies, which multiply and grow upon us as we advance in speculation. Till at length, having wandered through many intricate mazes, we find ourselves just where we were, or, which is worse, sit down in a forlorn steps. So this is the progress of bad philosophy. Um, and uh, good philosophy is going to avoid this. So how can we avoid this? Now, um, one way you might think of avoiding this would be to say, look, we aim too high to begin with. We thought that we could correct all our errors through reason and achieve certainty about everything, but unfortunately we just didn't realize that a lot of the things we wanted to know about are beyond the power of our knowing, or at least of knowing with certainty. Um, so the mistake was um, in doing this without first considering, stopping to consider what the limits of our faculties are, how far we can reasonably expect to go. Um, so that's Locke's answer. And Barclay alludes to that in section two. The cause of this is thought to be the obscurity of things or the natural weakness and imperfection of our understandings. Um, right, so, so that's basically the moral of the essay concerning human understanding, that the reason we get involved in all kinds of uncouth paradoxes and so forth is that we um, try to go farther than our faculties can actually carry. Oh, I'm sorry, I just, I didn't notice a whole bunch of things about how the com camera was blurry. Um, is it, which camera is blurry? This camera is blurry? Both. Okay, I don't understand that because it's not blurry on my screen. Uh, I don't know what to do except maybe is that blurry? I think, um, so it's clear here, which means the recording, assuming the damn thing makes a recording this time, but actually this time I'm making two recordings. I guess that possibly could be the problem somehow. Let me see what happens if I pause the other recording. Did that change anything? So it's, um, there are several Zoom connections going at the same time from my house. But that's been true in the past too and it hasn't had this effect. I don't know what to say. I guess I will just try to write bigger or something. 
uh, since it's clear here, I think the recording should be clear. But uh, I can't stop the other two Zoom sessions because it's my two kids doing stuff. Um, all right, I'll just keep going here. Um, So I'll just say what I'm pointing at, <laughs> if you can't read it. Um, so, uh, right, so Locke's answer to this problem, uh, which will also be Kant's answer, is that the problem is that we, we overestimated the powers, uh, the, our faculties of knowledge. But um, Locke doesn't accept that. He says that our natural faculty, I mean, sorry, Barclay doesn't accept that. He says that our natural faculties couldn't possibly be to blame for this um, because this at least I can make bigger by moving this down. But uh, let's see. We should believe that God has dealt more bountifully with the sons of men than to give them a strong desire for that knowledge which he had placed quite out of their reach. Right? Meaning, this is basically, this is a God is not a deceiver argument. Um, right? Barclay is using the same argument that uh, Descartes uses. For a slightly different purpose, um, <clears throat> but he's using it against, uh, well, he's using it for the same purpose in this respect. They both conclude that there isn't any, both Descartes and Barclay conclude that there couldn't be anything that we strongly desire to know, but is absolutely beyond our powers. Um, whereas Locke and Kant are both on the side that there's lots of things we strongly desire to know, but we will never be able to know. So according to Bar Barclay, then, uh, according to Descartes, the answer is we just go through with this, right? Um, which Barclay thinks leads to unacceptable consequences. So, or leads nowhere, one or the other. So Barclay says, um, no, the problem isn't with our faculties. The problem is with our use of our faculties, meaning it's not God's fault, it's our fault. So this also basically is Descartes' answer. This is basically what Descartes talks about in the fourth meditation. Um, we just uh, um, judged too soon, we concluded too soon, uh, we hadn't thought or without the correct, careful uh, thought that should have gone into it. But uh, Barclay is accusing Descartes of that as well. So, um, so Barclay is saying that uh, if we had paid attention, we never would have gotten into this trouble. And what should we have paid attention to to avoid getting into this trouble? Well, without noticing it, so to speak, we accepted two false principles and never carried them into doubt, never cast them into doubt. So, I mean, so I guess you could say so far, Barclay is on Descartes' side against Locke, but now he's going to say that. Descartes and Locke made the same mistake, and he's mostly focused on Locke. Um, and the mistake is, it, notice this is why it's called a treatise concerning the principles of human knowledge. It's a treatise concerning the false principles of human knowledge that have been ex wrongly accepted that um, Barclay wants to get rid of. <laughs> And the two false principles have something in common. Um, they're both, uh, they both involve, so to speak, 
attributing to our understanding or intellect an impossible power to free itself from sense. And if you say, well, that sounds just like Locke, right? He's saying that we don't have a power that we think we do. But the difference is that Locke says we don't have a power that we understand what it would be like to have that power in some sense, but we just don't have it. Um, whereas Barclay says the power we think we have, we don't have it because it's absurd and impossible. There could be no such power. Right, so unlike Locke, who you know, every once in a while reminds us that maybe, although we can't do this, maybe angels can, Barclay is talking about something that angels couldn't do either because it's a uh, contradiction in terms, it doesn't make any sense. Um, so uh, that's what the two principles have in common, the understanding or intellect can't free itself from sense. So uh, this is uh, part of what makes it makes sense, at least from a certain point of view, to say that Berkeley is an empiricist and moreover a more radical empiricist than Locke, right? He's, he's criticizing Locke for basically having assumed, along with Descartes, uh, taken for granted certain principles that um, make it seem like well, not make it seem like we could, but, but uh, imply that we do somehow use our reason or understanding or intellect in a way that's free of sense experience to uh, an extent that is absurd or impossible. Okay, so that's what the two principles, false principles have in common, but then there's two of them. And the first one has to do with ideas. And the second one has to do with propositions. Actually, I should, let me just see one more thing about, is the screen still blurry? Oh, can't that argument be applied to literally anything we have a strong desire for? Yes. Yes, it can. So Barclay says that anything that we have, in, well, a natural strong desire for, how do we know that this desire is natural? I think Locke and Kant both agree that it is, but you can imagine saying, someone saying, no, it's artificial, right? But um, and certainly Aristotle agrees that it is. That's the beginning of the metaphysics. All human beings, by nature, desire to know. And know what? Metaphysics. <laughs> All right. But anyway, um, um, yes, anything we have a strong natural desire for uh, is something that we can possibly attain. Just like all the other animals, their desires are proportionate to their environment. We don't have a strong desire for things that are normally impossible for them. That's the claim, yeah. Okay, um, if the screen is still blurry, no, I thought I might be connected to the wrong Wi-Fi network, but no, I'm not. All right. Okay, so, um, so the first principle is about ideas and the second principle is about propositions. So in the case of, ideas, the power that we think we have, but we actually, not only do we lack it, but it's absurd, is the power to abstract from the particular ideas that we get through sensations to form new general ideas, which uh, no particular object uh, exhausts, so to speak. 
So that's one power we think we have that we don't. And the second power we think we have that we don't, um, and this is the one that concerns propositions, is the power to infer or even just suppose, that is to entertain the thought, that's why I say this has to do with propositions, to entertain the thought that there's some secondary external object that is represented by our idea. Um, so uh, obviously the way those, I just stated those, which is basically the way Barclay states them, uh, they're both aimed squarely against Locke, right? Those are two cornerstones of his system. Um, number one, that we can form abstract ideas, abstract general ideas. And number two, that the operations of our mind can have both an immediate object, which is an idea, and by way of the idea, immediate object, which is not an idea. Um, and uh, so, the, so the attack then, given that the principles are stated this way, is going to be mostly aimed against Locke. Um, however, Barclay says that everyone, not just Locke, has always assumed, taken these principles for, for granted, or almost everyone. He calls it a universal error. So at least he believes that he's, in, I, sorry, I should say by everyone, I mean all philosophers, all metaphysicians, right, have always made these two assumptions, and that's why we've never got anywhere in the science. Because these two principles that everyone has taken for granted are not only false, but they're absurd, and that they're absurd means basically that no one has ever really believed them because you can't really believe something that's absurd. Rather, um, we've just, uh, to the extent that we think that we're raised above the level of mere common sense, we've uh, convinced ourselves or at least convinced others that we believe these things um, in order to be able to take them for granted and go on from there. So um, for this one, that's maybe not going to be such a hard sell. That is, you imagine telling the plain person of common sense, uh, look, the philosophers tell you that there's all these ab mysterious abstract ideas, and universals and whatever, but they're just pretending. No one believes in that. It doesn't make any sense. You can imagine the, the plain spokesperson for common sense saying, yeah, yeah, that sounds right. But the second one is going to be a harder sell because the second one means that, um, for example, bodies, not only are we not certain they exist, not only do they actually not exist, but we're not even thinking anything when we think they, they exist. Because the whole idea of a body external to our ideas is um, absurd. So the person of plain common sense is going to be like, wait, I thought there was a material world outside my ideas. Um, but nevertheless, Barclay is going to claim that um, what he's saying actually doesn't contradict what ordinary common sense people believe about the world, it only contradicts a false metaphysical interpretation of that concept. Okay, so that's the overall content of the book, basically. And the two principles are split between the two parts of the book that we have. The first one is dealt with in the introduction, and the second one is dealt with in part one. Don't know if there would have been a third false principle in part two. And if so, what it would have been. But maybe not. It probably would have just been this false principle again. 
this probably would have been the subject of a whole book outside the introduction. Okay. So today, the reading for today was the introduction. So um, oh, someone just asked, is God the perceiver? Well, um, I'm the perceiver of my ideas. So um, in the first place, we're talking about me and my ideas. Now there is something about God perceiving things, as we'll see, that's actually um, not as straightforward as you might think it is. Um, I know that's what Barclay is famous for, for saying that the world is God's perception or something like that. It's not uh, even clear to me that he really believes that. However, um, like I said, we don't have to get to that yet. Right now, we're just talking about me and my ideas. OK. But, and right now, we're not even talking about perceiving the world yet. We're talking about whether I can have abstract general ideas or not. Okay. So uh, what we know about abstract ideas is, uh, or what we know about Barclay's argument against abstract ideas is that it's an argument against Locke. So whatever abstract ideas he's arguing against, they must be the kind of thing that Locke believes we have and Barclay believes we don't have. And that actually turns out to be a little bit hard to pin down what that is. So um, first of all, let me begin with this. This is the introduction. Um, everything today is going to be begin. Well, now I actually am going to quote from part one a little bit. So maybe I'll keep telling you every time that it's the introduction. So this is section seven of the introduction, and um, it's on page nine. It is agreed on all hands. Barclay says that a lot. Um, sometimes, maybe always, it just means that even Locke admits this. <laughs> He's not really thinking about any other hands. But anyway, uh, it is agreed on all hands that the qualities or modes of things do never really exist, each of them apart by itself and separated from all others but are mixed, as it were, and blended together, several in the same object. So here, it looks like uh, we have an allusion to a very specific passage in Locke. And it's a passage that I emphasized when we talk about Locke, book two, chapter two, section one, Though the qualities that affect our senses are in the things themselves so united and blended that there is no separation, no distance between them. Right? That seems to be pretty clearly the passage in Locke that Barclay is talking about. Um, and uh, Locke goes on, yet his plain that the ideas they produce in the mind. And so you think, 
that uh, what's going to go on, come after that is yet just plain that we can abstract them from each other in the mind. But of course, as I pointed out when we talked about Locke, that's not how it goes on. It goes on to his plane, the ideas they produce in the mind enter by the senses, simple and unmixed. Right, so this is why I kept emphasizing when I talked about this section that according to Locke, the abstraction happens the first abstraction, so to speak, happens between the thing and my mind, not in my mind, and it's done by my sense organs. Right? So, like, here's the snowball. In the snowball, whiteness, coldness, and all the other qualities, that is, powers, are all mixed together and can't be separated one from another. They're all due to the same texture of microscopic parts. Actually, in the case of a snowball, you can kind of explain why it's white based on the parts you can see even, but never mind. All right. So, um, and yet, the ideas of whiteness and coldness and so forth enter my mind simple and unmixed. Why is that? Well, the snowball affects my eye in one really specific way. It's a way that would not change if it went from cold to hot. It will only change if it changes its color from white to something else. So in other words, my, my eye is like a specialized detector for only the power to do one particular kind of thing. And somehow, however this works, my eye is what's connected to, um, to, the, to causing the perception of the idea of white in my mind. So I get one simple unmixed idea of white from the particular way the snowball affects my eye. And if I'm touching the snowball, Meanwhile, I get some other, another simple unmixed idea of white by the particular way the snowball affects something or other in my finger, the temperature sensor. It's fine. <laughs> right, this, this is my hand. Is it okay if I ask a question about this dude? Why is this <laughs> snowball affecting his eyeball and his finger? He's looking at it and he's touching it. What is looking at a snowball allowed to do with his eyeball? Like, yeah, why is it hurting his eyeball? It's not hurting it, it's affecting it. Like, <laughs> who said this? <laughs> Locke. All right. Sorry. It's okay if you ask a few questions, Margaret, but I think, you know, like, whatever. <laughs> Unless, is, is, are there any of the students who want to hear an answer to this? I guess not. But anyway, I'll just say affecting here doesn't mean hurting. It just means it's doing something to his eye. Okay. All right. Okay. So, um, so um, it's not the case. According, it, Locke agrees. It's agreed on all hands that the qualities in the snowball are inseparably blended together. But Locke doesn't agree at all that the ideas of those qualities are ever inseparably blended together. On the contrary, from the first time they come in, they're already pure and unmixed. Um, and as we saw, that's how Locke understands the process of abstraction is that I somehow get myself to focus on those pure unmixed ideas and detach them from the other circumstances they came in with. Okay. So, um, so what is the disagreement about then? There's definitely a disagreement, but what is it about? Well, um, of course, Barclay denies, this is what he's going to say in part one, but we've already had a preview of it. Barclay denies that there's any such place as between the snowball and my mind. 
right? That is, Barclay denies that any of this is there. What's there is my mind perceiving ideas. So Locke's story about how the qualities are blended and yet I can form separate ideas of them uh, is not one that Barclay could agree with or in a sense it's not even one he can argue with because he thinks the presupposition is absurd. Um, however, he still has to disagree with Locke about something about ideas, right? I mean, that is, if the only disagreement were whether there's something else out here that's blend inseparably blended together, then as far as what kind of ideas we can have, he and Locke would agree, the question would be whether there's something else. So the, so the only disagreement would be about the second false principle, the one he's going to discuss in part one, there wouldn't be a separate disagreement about the first part, part, false principle. So forgetting about the external object now, what is it that Barclay thinks Locke is wrong about? Don't fight me. So Locke must think that, I mean, Barclay must think that Locke is wrong about abstract ideas because he's wrong about concrete ideas. Right? That is, Locke thinks, so let me draw it this way. By the way, those other zoom. Is people's audio off? Oh, okay. Oh. Oh, I guess when someone said the last word I heard was snowball, you, you meant that was the last word I paid attention to. All right. Anyway. <laughs> um, okay. Um, so let me draw it this way. Locke versus Barclay. So Barclay says, we can't have abstract ideas because the ideas are inseparably blended. Now Locke says, so like, I mean, I'm gonna draw the idea of a snowball according to both of them. Locke says the idea of this particular concrete snowball consists of a bunch of simple ideas. This is the idea of a snowball, according to Locke. It consists of a bunch of simple ideas, but the simple ideas themselves don't require each other. They can be separated from each other. They're pure and unmixed. If I, if I consider them as they are in the mind, such appearances separate from all other existences, etc., as Locke puts it, um, uh, then I'll see that I can use any one of them by itself without the others. So like if one of them is the idea of white, um, once I use my various mental faculties of discernment and comparison and so forth and arrive at abstraction, I'll realize that I can take just this idea of white off by itself and use it as a standard to compare any object to, and any object will agree with it if and only if it's white. And that's my general abstract idea of white. So according to Locke, it was there all along inside the concrete idea, or particular idea, as Locke calls it. Inside it all along was the abstract idea of white. I just have to get it out. So if Barclay thinks Locke has gone wrong about that, Barclay must think, that in the idea of a snowball, at least some of the things that Locke thinks are separable ideas are actually inseparable. 
Maybe all of them or maybe some of them. Okay, are there questions about that so far? All right. Um, so which is it? Is it all of it or all of them or some of them? Well, so now I'm going to move forward to the beginning of part one, getting ahead of ourselves. This is part one. Um, section one, page 23. And that's, well, so first he has a list of the ways we get various ideas. By sight, I have the ideas of light and colors. By touch, I perceive, for example, hard and soft, heat and cold, smelling furnaces with odors, etc. And as several of these are observed to accompany each other, they come to be marked by one name and so to be reputed as one thing. So this seems to show that Barclay agrees with Locke that for the most part, the idea of a concrete thing or a type of concrete thing is um, composed of ideas that we've observed to come together, right? That is, it's founded on constant conjunction. Um, and uh, that's how we know they go together. And that's why we decide to call that the idea of one thing. So that means that at least for the most part, actually, Barclay agrees that these simple ideas that make up my idea of the snowball could have come separately. Right, otherwise I wouldn't need experience to know that they constantly go together. If they're, in, if they're obviously inseparable, then, um, um, can know right away that they always go together. And just to be sure that uh, this is what Barclay means, still in part one, section five, on page 25, among a list of things that Barclay agrees we can imagine separate, separated from each other. Thus, I imagine the trunk of a human body without the limbs, or conceive the smell of a rose without picking on the rose itself. So far, I will not deny I can abstract. Um, and similarly, section 35 of part one, sorry, section 32 of part one on page 35. Thus, for example, having observed that when we perceived by sight a certain round luminous figure, we at the same time perceived by touch the idea or sensation called heat, we do from thence conclude the sun to be the cause of heat. Right? So what that means is that although uh, there's a constant conjunction between the visible sun and the sun that I can feel heating me um, to the point where I start to think that heat is an effect of the sun, so the power of heating in addition to the power of, I mean, 
So, I mean, Barclay actually thinks there's no power of either kind in the sun, but, but um, the, um, the correct thing I conclude here, I think, according to Barclay, is I think that the power of heating belongs together in one idea with the power of with the visible sun. Or sorry, the, the sensation, the idea of heat belongs together in one idea with the sense of the sun, but only because I've observed them to always come together. And so it's convenient for me to collect them into one idea. And similarly, what he said about the rose, right? If one of these, if this were the idea of a rose rather than the idea of a snowball, one of these ideas would be the smell. And Barclay is saying, oh yeah, of course you can abstract that because that's an idea that could come on its own without all the others. So, um, in general, actually, Barclay agrees with Locke that the abstract idea is there to begin with and the idea of the concrete frame, and that we don't do anything mysterious when we take it out. Because it was always a different idea, and we only collected it together with the others because it occurred with them. So what is it they actually disagree with? So I think um, what it comes down to is basically three very special cases. Um, and the three special cases are all already kind of weird cases in Locke. Um, but they're also very important cases for Locke. So in other words, Barclay isn't making a big deal about nothing. Um, but he is maybe implying that their disagreement is a little bigger than it actually is. So um, the first kind of case is the case of some very abstract ideas like unity and being. Um, and in that case, Barclay is basically going to deny that there are such ideas. So um, we'll come back to this later because it turns out to be somehow involved in Barclay's proof that the second principle is false. Um, he's going to say that in the case of ideas, there isn't a difference between, that we can draw between they're being perceived and they're existing, right? There aren't two different ideas we can separate from each other, one being my idea and the other existing, so that we could say that they, um, that something might have one but not the other. So we'll come back to that later. Um, this also could be called transcendental ideas. I'm not sure if they might also might also apply to power and limits discussed in law. Um, okay, but um, the second case is the case of abstraction from simple ideas. So, by the way, I said this is already a weird special case in Locke, right? It's weird because every idea somehow comes together with these other ideas of unity and being. And moreover, as I argued, there can't be a separate power in the object of causing the idea of unity and being in addition to causing me to perceive whatever sensible ideas I get from it. Um, so that's a weird case in Locke, but an important case. Second case, um, abstraction from, from simple ideas. So let's say, suppose I take um, all my simple ideas of colors, or a lot of them anyway, and from them, Locke says, I can form the abstract idea of color in general. How can I do that? Because all those ideas of colors are already simple ideas, according to Locke. Right, so like white, blue, red, whatever, those are all simple ideas, according to Locke. So, the, so the, the 
the picture that, you know, whiteness and color originally came in pure and unmixed, so now I can take them apart. Locke is going to deny. Okay. Whiteness, the, that original idea that came in of whiteness was simple already. It didn't have parts. So um, it's not clear how Locke understands this, but um, it's clear not only that he does use uh, abstract ideas like this, like the idea of color, but as Barclay points out, he has to use them, he has to think we use them in forming almost every other abstract idea. So, um, Going back to the introduction, section nine, on page 10. Um, talking about the idea of humanity, human nature, the idea of man, as Locke puts it, and I think, yeah, as Barclay also puts it, the abstract idea of man, or if you please, humanity or human nature. That's certainly an important abstract idea that Locke claims that we have. The traditional example, not just in Locke, of an abstract idea. Wherein it is true there is included color because there is no man but has some color. This is an interesting example, obviously, from the point of view of uh, racial differences or whatever, but I don't think that's really what Barclay is interested in, what Barclay himself is interested in here at all. Um, again, this is just kind of the traditional example, right? Socrates is white, Socrates is black, which means Socrates like, gets pale or turns to darker or something like that. Anyway, because there is no man that has some color, but then it can be neither white, nor black, nor any particular color. Because there is no one particular color wherein all men partake. So the idea of humanity, Barclay is pointing out, um, it's not an idea of something that might have no color, right? Anything that falls under that the idea has to have a color. But on the other hand, it's not the idea of something that has any particular color because the various things falling under that idea are different color from each other. So it seems like that abstract idea of humanity has to contain this, um, this weird abstract idea of color. Right? One of its constituents is color, not any particular idea of color, but the abstract idea of color in general. So again, a strange case in Locke, but perhaps a really important case. Perhaps if you can't explain this, you won't be able to explain any other abstract ideas, or almost any other abstract ideas. Um, I never talked about how Locke could do this when, when we were in the right part of Locke to talk about it because I didn't have time. Um, he doesn't say anything about it as far as I know anywhere. Um, we know that he thinks uh, that we can see relations between simple ideas. Um, maybe somehow this form of quote unquote abstraction doesn't, it's not similar to the other kinds of abstraction. It doesn't really involve taking something away, it just involves noting a certain relation between certain simple things. Um, that would be what Rudolf Carnap called quasi abstraction. Um, in any case, be that as it may, uh, so this is also is a point where, well, so, it's a point where Bar Barclay and Locke disagree, and it's about something important. But the fact that it is these, that there are these weird cases means it's hard to be sure what Locke's position in response is. 
right? As Barclay has picked on the places where Locke's general account doesn't seem to work. And then, um, so it's hard to know how Locke would defend himself. The third one, therefore, although it's also a bit of a special case, is probably the most interesting. And the third one, well, all I can do is write down two ex apparent examples of this. I don't know if there are other examples. The first example is color and visible figure. Barclay, in a book he published the year before this book called, uh, called, the, new, called the New New Theory of Vision. It's called something towards a new theory of vision. But anyway, um, so in the New Theory of Vision, Barclay argues at length that visible figure and tangible figure are not the same kind of thing at all. Um, but so that's why I write visible figure here, color and visible figure. Um, and the other example is primary qualities. Not that Barclay calls it that. In fact, Barclay attacks Locke's distinction between primary and secondary qualities. But um, the things that fall under this third type, besides color and visible figure, seem to be tangible solidity, figure, motion, bulk, those things that Locke calls primary qualities. And in those cases, um, Locke thinks there's a necessary visible relation between them. I guess you would say that in this case too, color and visible figure. Um, if he, he does say that we know about figure both through touch and through vision. Um, so I guess he would agree on this one too, but um, in this case, uh, Locke agrees that there's a visible necessary connection between the ideas. We understand why they have to come together and yet, Locke says they're different ideas, and we can consider them an abstraction from one another. So we can consider the motion of the snowball without its figure, or the figure of the snowball without its size, the tangible figure. Um, So um, although I think this is Barclay's first example of this, right? He talks about um, um, you know trying to abstract from the color of a certain figure and how that's impossible, they're inseparable. Um, I think he spends he mostly focuses on this one, and uh, for good reason because. Um, the question of whether we can have abstract ideas of primary qualities um, has to do with um, the possibility of geometry and a certain understanding of what geometry is and therefore also the possibility of mechanistic physics, right? Physics according to which um, bodies are solid um, figured extensions that push each other around. And that's all they are. Um, so, I mean, uh, that makes this case both kind of um, an advantage Barclay wants to get out of his view in the end. As we'll see, he some of the absurd things he thinks that we started to believe because of this false principle of about abstract ideas are. Um, Margaret, could you maybe not make that? What? Noise? <laughs> I'm, I'm 
Oh, usually you can cut like. Yeah, but that makes it all just fly out. Have to go like this. I'll take care of it. <laughs> okay, all right, whatever. Just, okay. There's only that much left. All right, sorry about that. Um, by the way, did the picture get clearer when the other two Zoom sessions ended? No. Well, that is weird. I hope the recordings aren't also blurry. I don't see any blur here at all. Hopefully it won't happen again. I could try to leave the meeting and start it over again, only last time I did that, that was one of the times it failed to record. I'm also having many can make an recording now, but I don't want to rely on that working. Okay, thank you a lot. Um, all right, we'll just go on with the blurry board, I guess. Um, so in a way, this is an advantage because Barclay think once some of the absurd Paradoxes that Barclay wants to refute are paradoxes in geometry. And one of the things he especially takes aimed at is the view that extension is infinitely divisible. Um, so in the end, he's going to like the idea that geometry, as we usually understand it, isn't exactly right. Um, but it also, at this stage, uh, means he's confronted with an objection which is that someone says, well, how are any geometrical proofs possible at all? Um, because, so uh, for example, if I want to prove that the interior angles of a triangle add up to two right angles, so um, if there's no abstract ideas, that means that as I carry out the proof, I have to be thinking about some particular triangle. Let's say it's one, of course, this isn't perfectly a triangle at all, which is going to be part of Barclay's point about geometry. But anyway, let's say it's a triangle that looks kind of like this one. So I finished the proof and I show that these three angles are equal to these two angles. And it seems like that's all I've shown. Draw another triangle, a different shape triangle, a same shape triangle somewhere else, any other triangle, and I have to do the proof again because I was thinking about this one when I did it. I wasn't thinking about triangles in general because there is no thinking about triangles in general. That would mean having an abstract idea of a triangle in general, and that would mean um, separating triangleness from the particular characteristics of these features and it would fall under this example where Locke says you can do it perhaps in part also under this example but anyway um, where Locke says you can do it and Barclay says you can't. So how is Barclay going to account for the fact that I don't have to do the proof again for every single triangle but from one proof like this I can learn something that's true of all triangles. Um, so this is his explanation. Um, okay. Wait, were I already on that? Um, anyway, oops. This is his explanation, the introduction in section 16, on page 15. I answer that though the idea I have in view, whilst I make the demonstration B, for instance, so Though the idea I have in view whilst I make the demonstration be, for instance, that of an isosceles rectangular triangle whose sides are of a determinate length, I may nevertheless be certain it extends to all other rectilinear triangles. By rectilinear triangles, it means a triangle with straight edges. 
that is what we usually call trying. Um, I may mean, nevertheless be certain it extends to all other rectilinear triangles of what sorts or bigness soever. And that because neither the right angle nor the equality nor determinate length of the sides are at all concerned in the demonstration. It is true the diagram I have in view includes all these particulars, but then there is not the least mention made of them in the proof of the proposition. So the answer is, um, yes, I did the proof using this particular triangle. But as the proof went on, I didn't use or mention any particular characteristics of this triangle. Now, um, how can we understand that? I mean, so according to Barclay, every time I say triangle in the demonstration, the only idea I have in my mind that corresponds to that word is this triangle. So isn't it the case that every time I say triangle, I'm mentioning this triangle and not any other triangle? Um, so, um, that raises a general question about how signs mean things. And I think we'll see that Locke and Barclay disagree about that. And that maybe even is the heart of their disagreements. But um, for now, just for an immediate answer, um, Barclay goes on to say on the next page, And this, by the way, was, is part that was added in the second edition. So in other words, he, pre he presumably heard some complaints about what he said previously. And here it must be acknowledged that a man may consider a figure merely as triangular without attending to the particular qualities of the angles or relations of the sides. So far, he may have struck, but this will never prove that he can frame an abstract, general, inconsistent idea of a triangle. So at least according to that addition, Barclay is um, saying the following. Uh, true enough, as, as I continue the demonstration, the only idea I have in my mind of a triangle is this one. And then he's saying two things, and the relationship between the two isn't that clear. But one is that I'm not mentioning any particular characteristics of this triangle. And the other is that I'm not considering this idea with respect to those particular characteristics. So um, I think the easiest way to understand this would be to start with that second one and say that it explains the first one. So we would say that, um, and I'll write them up here. That what really allows me to carry out the proof is that I can so far abstract that I, so to speak, don't pay any attention to the particular characteristics of this triangle as I do the proof. And so that's why when I say triangle during the proof, although this is the idea I have in my mind that corresponds to that word, um, I'm not mentioning this particular triangle, this particular characteristics. 
because at the time that word stand for that idea, I wasn't paying attention to those particular things. Something like that. So the problem with that answer, however, is that um, it doesn't seem to be any different from Locke's view. Um, can we go back to book three, chap uh, chapter three, section 11 of the essay? In page 371. Um, in this section, Locke um, admits, or I mean, he doesn't really treat it as an admission in the face of an attack, he just like reminds us. That everything that actually exists is a particular according to him. And that means that all things are particular and all words are particular and all ideas are particular. When therefore we put particulars, the generals that rest are only creatures of our own making their general nature being nothing but the capacity they are put into by the understanding of signifying or representing many particulars. I'll read the last part. For the signification they have is nothing but a relation that by, that by the man, mind of man is added to them. So this sounds like he's saying exactly what I just said about this triangle. When I do the proof, I have in my mind some particular idea. It might as well be this particular idea of this particular triangle. It doesn't really matter. It's some particular idea. Its generality consists not in some special intrinsic character of generality that it has, but in the fact that I'm using it to stand for many particulars. And it's a relation that by the mind of man is added to. Well, that sounds no different from Barclay saying, um, well, I'm just not paying attention to these characteristics, right? That is, its generality is something that it has by virtue of the way I'm using it, not by virtue of its own intrinsic characteristics. Um, so what is really at stake here? Um, so I think there are actually two really important differences between them in this area. Um, And the first one is this. Um, let me go back to uh, the principles. Introduction, section 12, page 13. An idea which considers itself is particular becomes general by being made to represent or stand for all other particular ideas of the same sort. So suppose, um, and it's always, this red marker doesn't erase as well. 
Um, so now this direction is going to be time. Okay, so suppose at this time, um, I um, think about triangles in general using this particular idea of this triangle A. And now suppose I want to think about triangles at some other time. So according to Barclay, how can I do that? Well, I can get some other idea of a triangle. Mm. Actually, let me not, not draw them differently. I can get another idea, another particular idea of a triangle, right? So there was other stuff in between. These are not the same particular idea, even though they might be perfectly similar. They might be identical in lots sense. Um, so, um, but uh, they're not the same idea. Professor, we are not seeing the board. Are you using the board? Sorry, I'm using the board. Thank you for reminding me again. There we go. Okay. Mm -hmm. This direction is time. <laughs> Suppose I think um, of a triangle now and I think of a similar triangle later. So according to Barclay, what I have is two different ideas. And what is it that makes either one of them count as a general idea of this type of triangle? So according to Barclay, it's the fact that this one and this one have been made a sign of all other ideas of the same sort. So this one has been made a sign of this one, and this one has made a sign of this one. Whereas according to Locke, well, actually, I'm going to drop that. According to Locke, um, I'm not going to say. Yeah, I should have. Okay. Yeah, let me make these different after all. No. I'm somehow getting boxed up about this. But okay, I'll just draw something that happens according to Locke. So according to Locke, um, I can have these two ideas of triangles at two different times. Um, and
Oh my, I'm almost out of time too. All right, no, let me start. Let me start this over again. Suppose I use the uh, general idea of triangles at two different times to think of two different triangles. That's what I'm. That's what I'm trying to get from here. So, um, because according to Barclay, that's how the proof is going to work, right? That as I did the proof with one particular triangle, now I'm going to apply it to another triangle. And I can do that because I was using the particular idea of the particular triangle and the general idea. So the way it works is I did it with this idea of a triangle. Now um, uh, I have to be able to think of a different triangle using the same general idea of triangle. How does that work according to Barclay? So the way it works according to Barclay is the different triangle is a different idea. These are just different particular ideas. They're just, um, there's, remember there's no distinction between ideas and what they're ideas of. These are the two triangles. And what makes me it the case that I'm thinking of them both under the same general idea is that I was using this particular idea as a sign of this one and or using this particular idea as a sign of that one. However, according to Locke, um, the way a general abstract idea works, or at least the way it can work, is I choose one particular idea of a triangle and I use it to represent all triangles by this relation that the mind has given us. So we have the same idea that is the identical idea twice. And I can use it to think two different triangles. But what makes these two triangles different then? Because I'm thinking them through the same idea. How can they be different triangles? And the answer is the object is different. The, the external object is different. Here it's this triangle, and here it's this other triangle. So this is how Locke's account of abstraction works differently from Barclay's, and it requires the distinction between the idea and its object, which Barclay is going to deny. Um, or just to put the same thing, um, maybe this is just how I should have said it to begin with. According to Barclay, an idea becomes universal or general by being made a sign of many other ideas. What does it mean that it's a sign of many other ideas? Well, it means that um, by certain rules, I can kind of use it to stand for another idea that I'm going to get out later, something like this. Whereas according to Locke, this idea becomes general abstract by being made to stand for a lot of different things. So it's not just about um, what other ideas follow this one in some legitimate order, but it's about what this idea actually refers to outside of the world. And that's the thing that Locke believes in and Barclay does. Okay, I think I could have explained that more clearly um, and also more quickly because I've now got to the end. So I'm just uh, going to have to finish talking about this topic next time. Um, sorry about the blurry screen. Hopefully that won't be in the recording, and hopefully it won't happen again. And I will see you next week.